Good evening and welcome to another edition of Kingdom Seekers Bible Study. I'm Elder Trey Ferguson, and with your permission, we'll be spending the next few moments together. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for bringing us to this moment. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to slow down and open the pages of your word to learn more about how you have interacted with the people throughout the ages to the end that we might be transformed on the inside until it shows up on the outside. So God, right now we give you permission to make whatever changes you see fit on our souls so that we can be your ambassadors and your agents right here in our community. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Now, before we get into the lesson, I do feel compelled to address a tragedy that has affected a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. This past Saturday, uh, a gunman, a terrorist walked into a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, and began shooting people minding their own business for no reason other than the color of their skin and a few societal mechanisms that engendered a hate in his heart that does not make any sense. I don't desire or wish to be a part of a community or a movement that acts like these things don't affect us. They, they do impact us. I ran into Publix last night and it took a lot for me not to uh, lose my composure as I saw elderly black security guard wearing a bulletproof vest to help protect people doing their grocery shopping. Uh, and so my brothers and my sisters, uh, I stand before you right now as, as one who struggles to make sense of a world in which not only something like this could happen, but things plural like this happen and continue to happen. When we feel robbed of safety, going to Bible study as uh, people in Charleston, South Carolina discovered a few years ago, when we feel robbed of safety going grocery shopping with these people, when we don't feel safe going to schools anymore, all of these different places, it's okay and appropriate to lament. It's okay to feel things. And so for just a moment, I would ask that we take a moment of silence to think about the very real people who are no longer with us in, on this side of heaven um, and all of their families who, who are impacted, all of the communities, all of the people who will feel uh, the ripples of this in Buffalo, around the country and around the world. Uh, so for a moment, we're gonna put the names of those people up on the screen. We're gonna sit with that, um, sit with their memory and uh, let God do some work on the inside of us, amen? That times like this, I'm reminded of the scripture that says that we do not mourn as those who have no hope. And that particular scripture does not say that we do not mourn. To me, that sounds kind of dehumanizing, right? The, the fact that we wouldn't mourn at all. No. In fact, what it says is that we do not mourn as those who have no hope. And as one who follows a Jewish man named Jesus from a town called Nazareth, who was not only executed, but crucified, humiliated publicly and died a very real death, was buried in a tomb, but refused to stay dead, refused to be done. There is a hope that surpasses sense, logic, reasoning that compels us to keep on going even when things seem hopeless. 
So while we mourn and we hold space for these people who have lost their lives in the physical sense that we know right here, uh, I am yet compelled by the story of Jesus and the life of Jesus, a life that could not be defeated by death. And so uh, it is in that spirit that I uh, endeavor to keep on pushing through this study that we started a couple of weeks ago on the Jewishness of Jesus. This study that uh, asked the question, what do we do with the fact that Jesus was not a Christian? That Jesus did not go to church on Sundays? That Jesus did not have a pastor and, and this church that he tithe too regularly that Jesus did not have this Bible full of 66 books from Genesis to Revelation, that that was not the life that Jesus lived, but that Jesus was in fact a Jewish man. What do we do with that information? And uh, two weeks ago at the commencement of this study, we looked at uh, this idea of peoplehood and how uh, Jesus's Jewishness connected him to a very real people at a very real point in time. People who are still with us to this very day, by the way. We have lots of Jewish neighbors around the world and here in these United States to this very day. And how we can learn from that as people who are not Jewish, that we can find connection and peoplehood in the person and in the story of Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about this notion of the justice of Jesus and how all of the responsibilities that Jesus being a Jewish man would have felt to the people in his community, all of his neighbors, and even some people outside of his community, looking at some of those uh, laws that were given because of Jesus's identity as a, as a Jewish person, a Hebrew man who was uh, rescued from slavery in Egypt and how we ought to treat other people in light of that fact. All of these things have to do with the very real Jewishness of Jesus. And this week, if you all will allow me, I would like to talk about this concept of fulfillment. What do I mean by that? Jesus explicitly states that he didn't come to abolish the law, that he didn't come to erase the totality of Jewish scriptures or anything, but to fulfill them, to bring them to their purpose. And in doing this, uh, we see that there is this constant use of scriptures in what we would call the Old Testament, right? Uh, some people call it the Hebrew people. The Jewish term for much of it is called the Tanakh. Uh, all of these scriptures that are in our gospels and in our new testament they came from what we call the old testament and they're used in very creative ways so i want to talk about for the next few moments this concept of fulfillment and the creativity of scripture this is real it's a real interesting point to me a real interesting point for the simple fact that uh, i was trained in a church tradition that prioritized the original meanings of scriptures, right? And most of you guys, or a lot of you guys listening to this, whether you know this or not, are from that same tradition where the questions that we ask of scripture uh, often require us to look at what did the original author mean to the original audience and what do we do with that information? Like, that's how that goes. It's how we're trained to look at the scriptures. There's a problem with that. Because when I open up the Bible and I read through our beloved scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, but also even sometimes in the Hebrew scriptures, they don't seem to be following that same rule. There are plenty of times where they don't seem that concerned with what the original author meant to the original audience when they deploy scriptures and when they start using these scriptures to tell stories and to encourage people. It doesn't seem to be a primary concern. All right. I, I don't want to sound too nebulous here. Let me give you guys some examples. I'm going to start right in, in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the first book in our New Testament in Matthew chapter one, verse twenty three. 
uh, <laughs> there's a quote that that is directly from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, where it says that the birth of Jesus was foretold and it says, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And they point to a scripture in Isaiah and saying that Jesus's birth fulfills that very scripture, right? Because in Isaiah it says, all right, then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That sounds perfectly legitimate. That's what Isaiah said way back when. That's what happens right here in the script. Jesus fulfills that scripture until you go back and you read Isaiah in its full context. And what we discover is that Isaiah was speaking to a people who were discouraged by their reality, by this reality of, of losing their autonomy and the kingdom of Judah at the time. And, and they're afraid of what this looks like, what their future looks like. And Isaiah, the prophet says, okay, you need, you need a sign that God is still with us. Perfect. Look, look over there. Do you see that, that virgin and the word that we uh, have received as virgin in our translations was actually a generic word that can be translated as virgin, but also a young woman. It says, look at that girl over there. She going she gonna to have a baby. She's going to conceive a baby. She's going to have that baby. And by the time that, that baby is old enough to eat yogurt and know right from wrong, you'll have seen your salvation. You'll have seen God move in your midst. It was actually uh, uh, in this instance, in Isaiah's instance, uh, a picture of a time frame. By the time that that child is old enough to know right from wrong. So before he hits the preteen years, then you'll have already seen God move in your midst by sending somebody to rescue you. Yet and still, with full knowledge of that reality, the author of the Gospel of Matthew uses that scripture to say that this actually points us towards Jesus. Is that a rule violation? I mean, only if you're looking at it like one of us. But Jesus was not a Christian. Okay, y'all need another example. Y'all think I'm making this up. Uh, we go to the next chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, it says that, and they stayed there until Herod's death. It's describing the time that... Um, the, there was this uh, uh, decree issued by King Herod in uh, all of Judea, this colony, this administrative uh, uh, area where Jesus lived uh, under the reign of the Roman Empire. And the governor, the king of that area, Herod, says that issued a decree that all of these children, all of the boys under a certain age would uh, be put to death. And that Jesus's family, Mary, Joseph and Jesus fled to Egypt uh, to to avoid that whole situation uh, said that they stayed there until Herod's death. And this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt right there. It's pointing to a scripture in the old Testament. And one of the minor prophets, the book of Hosea, in fact, it says like out of Egypt, I called my son. So after Herod had died, the God called Jesus out of Egypt back to his home so that all of God's plans could be enacted through Jesus in the right place, right? Except when you look at what Hosea says in Hosea chapter 11, verse one, he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. It's actually talking about the story of the people who went down into Egypt during the famine in the time of Jacob right? The patriarch. That's what's being described. And if y'all remember last week, we talked about God's commissioning Moses to go back and let the people go. He says, I've heard the cries of distress. I've heard them and I'm going to act on their behalf. I'm going to free them. And Hosea chapter 11, verse one is recounting. He's remembering that story of the people, the Jewish people. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. This is a poetic verse here. It says, I called my son out of Egypt. Like I sent Moses to go and to bring them out of Egypt and out of bondage. So in effect, what the, 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 the storytellers right here in the gospel of Matthew are doing is they are grafting the story of Israel and onto Jesus in this moment. It says, hey, just like 
just like our people, Jesus was in Egypt to flee a hard situation, to flee distress, and was called back, called out by God for this purpose. Um, it's, it's interesting. It violates our rules because that's not what Hosea was talking about. What Matt, Matt, Hosea was not talking about Jesus, but Matthew was. Um, okay, I got one more example. Uh, this one going to come straight from Jesus' mouth, right? Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Jesus says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Okay, we might have missed what happened right there because our Bibles don't explicitly tell us what Jesus was doing right there, but he's actually quoting from a minor prophet, uh, a book that we would recognize as one of the minor prophets named Micah, because Micah chapter seven, verse six says, for the son despises his father, the daughter defies her mother, the daughter-in-law defies her mother-in-law, your enemies are right in your own household. But if you go into that scripture, into that passage, what the prophet Micah is doing is talking about all of this division that happens inside of the families and all of this disunity that, that has happened as a result of this distress and trying to make sense. A lot of these prophets in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures are referring to what do we do as a people in this time of, of distress, of being scattered? What do we do? And he's talking about this division and Jesus takes that quote and he says, no, as a matter of fact, I've, I've come to do that. I've come to do all of that dividing because the way that I'm doing the way that I'm pursuing the way of life that I'm doing is going to cause some tension between the older generations and the younger generations to the point where like, maybe your children aren't going to see things the way that you do. All right. That's a whole nother thing. That's not what we're talking about right here. But over and over, I find myself captivated. I find myself mesmerized by all of the freedoms and the liberties that these New Testament authors seem to be taken with these sacred scriptures of the Jewish people and the Jewish faith and all of the things they're doing. I'm like, that is not what they were talking about. And they keep on using these right in their own time to mean something that probably wouldn't have even been in the mind of the person who originally penned these scriptures. I'm amazed by the creativity that they use. And then I discover this principle that uh, the portability, right? Like the ability to, to take these scriptures and use them, the applicational nature of, of these scriptures, of what we would call the word of God to everyday life is more important than being able to quote it. It's more important than being able to identify the original author. It's more important than being able to identify the original audience. When you have sat with these scriptures long enough to put them in your heart and, and apply them to all of these uh, different areas of your life, how does this apply to me right here, right now? That is where our faith lives. That is where the movement of Christianity lives. That is where we go. And it's funny um, that we have so constrained ourselves to trying to nail down who the original author was. What did the original author mean? And what were they trying to say to the original audience? Because that doesn't seem to be the primary concern. The primary concern seems to be how does this apply to us? How does this apply to the truth that God is revealing in this time? And Jesus, not being a Christian, not being an evangelical, not being bound by these rules, being a Jewish person, engages in this very rich Jewish tradition of using scriptures creatively to connect people with their time here and now. Okay, I need to make some more sense for somebody. I'm going over heads. I can already see the eyes glazing over. You feel like you in a classroom. Ray Charles! once sang a song called I Got a Woman. And uh, in this song, 
Ray Charles sings about this amazing woman he's found and she 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 gives me money when, when he's in need and all of these things and uh, it, Ray Charles is a musical genius so of course the song takes off and all these things fast forward a few decades later an artist named Kanye West takes a sample of that song flips it a little bit he's called it a remix but he flips it and makes this song called Gold Digger Right. It's not even all of the same words that Ray Charles sings, but it's clear what he's referring to. She gave my money and, and all of these, <laughs> the, the, the same melody is put in and he makes a whole new song with it to fit the direction that he's going in. We call that a sample. It's something that happens in music all of the time. What it does is it connects a current generation with the stories and the art and the feelings of a previous generation, even if we weren't there to because I, I wasn't really alive when Ray Charles was popping like that, but I know Kanye West. And when I hear Kanye West in that particular song, I'm like, oh snap, where did this come from? And he had Jamie Foxx sing Ray Charles's part for the song. But then I want to go back and I watch the movie Ray and I find out more about this. Like, oh wow, I see so much of Ray Charles's influence in all of these songs, just from that one, she takes my money, that one little ball right there of being repeated in this instance. Okay, so some of y'all not Kanye fans, uh, may maybe, okay, I need to make sure that I'm getting this right. Some of y'all gonna be too holy for this one, but the spirit gave this to me, that's what I'm going with right here, right now. The Isley Brothers, let's have this song called Between the Sheets, and I looked this up. Between the Sheets, looking at the database uh, that I found, has been sampled over 147 times. It's popped up in songs like the Notorious B.I.G.'s Big Papa and Jay-Z's Ignorant-ish is the word I'm gonna say because this is a Bible study and I don't, I don't be cussing like that. Uh, but what happens is we take these songs that are embedded in the culture that are easily recognizable, we put a new twist on them and we make something new with them in that instance. And that is what we see happening over and over again in the life and ministry of Jesus. Y'all don't believe me. Okay, let me take you back to the word. Let me take you back to the Bible. Matthew chapter five in Jesus's sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter five, beginning at verse 21 in the New Living Translation, Jesus says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder if you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and be reconciled to the person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Jesus in that moment is quoting directly from the law of Moses when he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. Thou shalt not kill is what we get from the Ten Commandments. Uh, it's reiterated again in Deuteronomy. All of these things, people are familiar with the law of Moses, which was given at Sinai in the book of Exodus. It's expounded upon in Leviticus through all of the laws and how the, the law given to God, given to the people of God at Mount Sinai will impact their daily lives. It's rehearsed at Deuteronomy in, jo in Moses' final sermon and it, it's already in the brain but here's the thing everybody already knew that killing people was wrong before sinai how do we know that because moses killed somebody before sinai somebody sees moses kill him. they're like oh what you gonna do moses you gonna kill me like you did that egyptian people already know that murder is wrong we didn't need the ten commandments to tell us that but it's enshrined right there Nonetheless, it becomes a part of the people story that the God who rescued us from slavery has commanded us to live this way. And Jesus says, yes, you've heard that said, but I say to you, we need to take this 
even further. So Jesus isn't trying to leave Judaism behind. Jesus isn't trying to leave any of that. He says that this is what this means right here in our town, because we already know we're not supposed to be killing each other. But I say to you, if you hate someone, if you have any derogatory words to say about that person, it's the same as if you killed them, because murder isn't just what you're doing out here. Murder starts right here in your heart. And Jesus takes that very real re uh, uh, verse, this, this common refrain, everybody, thou shalt not kill. So everybody's cool with not killing. And Jesus says that if you want to be identified with the God who gave the law at Sinai, let's take it a step further. What does it mean? What, where does murder start? What does that look like? And he says, until we've examined that, then whatever sacrifices we plan on giving that God ain't even worth giving until we've reconciled the people who we have murdered in our hearts already. Moses didn't say that. Moses didn't say that if you mad at somebody or somebody has something against you, you can't sacrifice. Jesus says that that is the heart of this law. This is what it means. This is how we avoid even getting to that point of murder. And he does that by creatively sampling this scripture of Moses because Jesus doesn't plan on leaving Moses behind. He doesn't plan on starting a new religion. He plans on starting a movement where we're no longer comfortable with just relying on everybody else else's old jams and being able to cover the songs correctly. Uh, he wants to see new things happening in hearts. He wants all of that to happen. And so when we look at the Jewishness of Jesus and how Jesus wants to make sure that these same good old hits remain applicable in the here and now, that they're still connecting with people, what Jesus does is he takes these and what all of Jesus' followers do is they take these, these scriptures that are so well known and beloved and cherished and sacred to so many people. He says, this is what this means in our day and time. Jesus remixes the scriptures. He honors the scriptures by saying these are still applicable in our day and time. So yes, I recognize that this is the law of Moses. Yes, I know who the original author was and who the original audience was, but the original author is not here. God spoke through that original author and God is speaking to us right here, right now. The original audience is not here with us right now. We are connected as a people and so they live through us. What does this mean to us? And that is the creativity that allows this story of Jesus to resonate so richly in this new context. I get excited when I'm talking about this and when I look at how this principle is allowed in every single arena around us, I brought up the music for a reason because y'all know uh, Whitney Houston, I Will Always Love You was originally a Dolly Parton song. And it's gotten to the point right now where even Dolly Parton's like, nah, that's Whitney's song because she, she did it like that. So many of these stories, we, we don't even recognize as uh, scriptures from the prophet Isaiah or or the prophet Hosea anymore. No, no, that's, that's Jesus' jam at this point because he did it like that. And I'm inspired because Jesus said that greater works than these, when he's commissioning his disciples, greater works than, than the stuff I'm doing will you do. I feel liberated to open the Bible every single day and ask questions. What does this mean to us right here in this day and age? How can we remix this? How can we sample this to see the kingdom of heaven brought to bear right here on earth? How can we do this? Yes, we know that it's wrong to kill people. It's wrong to lie. But what, what principles does that mean? Where do we see that most uh, applied and most most prevalent in today's society? What is driving the desire to murder? Where, where do we see the hatred that would drive somebody to drive three hours to send people that they don't know to their grave? These are the questions that we need to be asking. And so we look at these scriptures and say, what do you have to say about the very real grief and the very real mourning? What do we say? Where can we find this hope? Since we do not grieve since we do not mourn as those who have no hope where can i find hope and if there is hope to be found in these scriptures in the person of jesus christ then i believe 
that we've been granted the liberty to chase after it, to make new songs, sing new songs, and to craft a world that would grant people hope and life after death, just like Jesus does. Let me pray with you. God, we thank you that you are not uh, a God who pressed play, took your hands off the wheel, watched the world unfold in a disinterested fashion, but that you are a God who continually speaks to us and through us, through your son, through your word, through your spirit. So God, we ask that by the power of your spirit, through your son, Jesus Christ, we might be awakened to all of the ways that these words still apply to us, that we might given, that we might be given a sanctified imagination to envision what your kingdom looks like, and that you would give us the courage and the faith to take the steps necessary to bring it to bear right here down on earth. So that when all is said and done, your love becomes the law of the land. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to pause and uh, give you, you guys an opportunity, as we do every Wednesday, to give towards our missionary efforts around the world. You can do it by giving to one of these four ways that you see on the screen right here. I want to thank you guys for spending this time with me. This is a very interesting topic, something I'm looking to because there are times when we take our scriptures and our faith and sometimes we act that there's a deficiency with Jesus's Jewishness, that it had to be fixed and completed with this thing called Christianity. And I think that that's a misreading sometimes. I think that we ought to be admirers of Jesus's Jewishness, that Christianity is this movement started by a Jewish man, that we come to know the God that he was pointing people towards. And so I'm inspired by this idea of peoplehood. I'm inspired by the justice that governs this community. I'm inspired by the creativity that they employed. And I hope that y'all can get excited with me. All right, I did all that stalling so you had a chance to press whatever buttons you wanted to give towards our missionary efforts. I want to pray with you guys one last time and then we're going to send each other on our merry way. Is that all right with you? God, we thank you. We honor you. We accept your blessings. And we ask for your grace in the things that we don't feel so blessed by. And now, may God bless each and every one of you and keep you. May God smile upon you, give you his favor, may he give you his peace. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen and amen. I hope to see each and every one of you guys on Sunday and again next week on Wednesday. God bless you.